We look at Sunday, we've been given a race to run. If you are in Christ, if you've trusted Jesus, you have been enlisted. It's not just that God's going to take you to heaven one day, and that, that's true. But there's a responsibility he's given us here on earth. And our Christian life, our Christian experience has been compared all throughout Scripture to a race. Every believer has a race to run. Our individual races are races of completion, not competition. I'm not in competition with any of you, and none of you are in competition with me. Um, the idea is it is not finish first place or anything like that. The idea of this race that we've been called to is just to finish. That's God's will for each of us, that we finish the race that he's been given us to run. You know, it's a good thing to know that we're not in competition. I'm not in competition with any other pastor. What God's called them to, what God's called me to, there, there are two different races. Uh, there might be some similarities in our races, but they're two different races. And so I'm not in competition with them. You're not in competition with any other Christian. We're just called to finish the race that we've been given. Our race is a race of completion, not competition. There are four necessary lessons that really arise out of Hebrews chapter 12 in the first two verses that are so necessary for us. They're ne lessons that we have to learn if we're going to complete our course, if we're going to receive a well done from God. And that's the whole aim in the end. The whole aim is for God to say well done. And, and as a believer, we lose sight of that sometimes. We, we get focused on everything else that's going on, everything, all the turmoil in our own hearts, all the turmoil in the world. And we lose sight of it. At the end, really, all that matters is that we could have pleased God. Uh, I know I've told you all before, but someone once told me, uh, my greatest fear is not failure. My greatest fear is succeeding in something that matters nothing to God. Right? Our, our greatest fear really ought to be, our, our greatest worry ought to be just not pleasing God. Our greatest aim as a believer is that one day we stand before him and God can look at us with a smile on his face and say, well done. You ran your race. You did a good job. Well done. Enter into the joy that's set before you. So the, the, there's four lessons. We looked at one Sunday. The first lesson that we learned was if, if we're going to run the race and if we're going to complete it, if we're going to keep running, number one, we have to learn to let it go. If we're to run our race effectively, we have to let go of anything and everything that may weigh us down. That includes both previous pain and present pleasures. Uh, we, we really looked more at previous pain on Sunday, having to lay aside those things. Maybe it's someone we, can't, we haven't forgiven. Maybe it's a, an instance in our life. We have to lay those things aside if we're going to run the race that God's given us to run. I didn't say as much about present pleasures, and I'm, I'm not going to go into it a whole lot tonight, but I'm starting to think for me. Um, I was telling Pastor Dave before we came in here tonight, I'm, I find myself just, I'm getting frustrated. And you know one of the things that, that's feeding my frustration for me is Facebook. Right, you cut it on, you see all, all these different stuff and everybody's opinions. And, and I'm starting to think for myself that maybe one of the things I'm going to have to do in order to run my race and not get distracted is just get off Facebook. Um, or at least, at least not pay very much attention to it. Uh, maybe one of the things that you're going to have to do, and I'm starting to think for myself that I might have to do to run my race effectively, is just, just very much limit my television consumption. Look, we don't, you know, Lindsay and I don't watch things. We try not to watch things that are inappropriate. But even still, you can watch appropriate things that aren't actually pushing you towards Christ. At night, I find myself a lot of times, and you probably do the same thing. You're tired, you go in, what do you do? You just cut the television on, and you're really not even paying attention to it. It's just kind of playing, and you're just kind of there. And I've started to think for myself, maybe what I need to do is take some of that time to say at this time of night we cut the television off and maybe, maybe we just read. Or maybe even we just sit. Or maybe we spend time with God. I, I'm realizing for myself, if I'm going to run my, my race and I'm going to run it in a way that pleases God and I'm going to complete it, I'm going to have to lay aside some things that aren't wrong, but they're also not so necessarily right. And you're probably going to make that same discovery if you want to be as effective for Christ as He wants you to be. So number one... If we're going to keep running, if we're going to complete the race, we've got to let some things go. Number two tonight, we're going to look at the second part in that. So number one, let it go. Number two, if we're going to complete our race, if we're going to keep running, we've got to lay some things down. Tonight, I want to talk about laying it down. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to start reading in verse number one. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, 
and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This command that we just read, that we are to lay aside every weight and the sin that easily ensnares or besets us, this command is not only that we let go of the things that are weighing us down, there's a second half to that command, and that is also not just that we let go of the things that are weighing us down, but we're also to lay down the things that might trip us up. The picture here that the writer is giving is the idea of, of, of a runner taking off a long robe. You, you can't run in a ball gown, right? You're going to get tripped up. The idea here is of a runner taking off a long robe because that robe may easily get tangled up in his feet and, and trip the runner. In the same way, certainly as, as we talked about on Sunday, we can't run a race effectively with a cake in our hands. We also can't run the race legally with cocaine in our veins. You, you think, well, that's kind of an extreme illustration, but I want it to be. There are some things that are off limits to us if we're going to run the race and run it effectively. And there are some things that our flesh and our enemy will present to us as things we need to run the race and to run it effectively. But in the end, it may disqualify us. Stimulants, think about stimulants. No matter how much they may seem to improve performance, they are illegal and they can get you banned from the track. Sin is the same way. Sin provides temporary thrills. Sin provides temporary energy, if you will. But it always, in the long term, does, does some very real damage that will not only bring shame to your name, but it will bring shame to the name of the team as well. The reality is, for all of us, if we do not play by the rules, we cannot win the prize. If we do not play by the rules, we cannot win the prize. Athletes may be able to get away with bending the rules. I'm certain that there are athletes that have been juicing for years. There are probably athletes that have been using performance uh, enhancing uh, steroids for years and they've gotten away with it. Athletes might be able to get away with it, but God's children can't. God is not going to let his children, those who are truly his children, God is not going to let them continue in sin. God will bring those things to light. And we really have a choice. Either we can bring those things to light before God and repent and move on, or it may be that God is forced to bring those things to light. We are very much encouraged here to let go of, lay aside all of those sins that easily beset us. The eyes of God are in every place, beholding the evil and the good, and, and no matter who it is, God will ultimately ensure that the rules are upheld. So it's in this light that we are told that we are to lay aside these sins that easily beset us. Now, I'm aware, um, and, and this isn't such an issue here, but, but I'm going to hit it anyway. I'm aware that, that sin is a dirty word. And, and those sins should be a dirty word to us so in one perspective. It actually has become a dirty word to us in another perspective. Many people really do not mind you preaching on sin as long as theirs remains unmentioned, right? I'm all for preaching on sin, just as long as you don't get anywhere close to my road. Furthermore, there are other people who are fine with preaching on sin as long as you don't say anything specific about it. Well, everybody can agree that we hate sin, don't we? Just as long as you don't say anything specific is a sin. In, in our politically correct culture, the idea of sin itself is taboo, you know, really behind the, the secular culture now, there's this push to even remove sin as a category. Uh, sin, is, sin is not wrong. Sin is a category that we've made up to shame people. And, and it's actually being said that the word sin needs to be removed from our vocabulary because sin brings people shame. Let me tell you something. Sin should bring people shame. But in our PC culture, we've got to do away even with the, the idea of sin. Sin is a taboo. But in God's world, it's not, the idea that, that, uh, it's not the idea that sin is taboo as a word. Sin is taboo as an action. Sin is, we, we've often said, sin is anything that misses the mark, anything that does not measure up to the standard of God's glory. So uh, according to that standard, there's a whole lot of things that we do that are sin that we would never classify as sins. Sin is anything that falls short of the glory of God. We could say it this way, sin is acting or reacting in any way that God would not react. And let me just stop there and say, for you and for those who will watch this online later, when I say the way God reacts, I'm talking about how God would react as he has defined his own reactions in his word, not as we would like to define God. God has said some very specific things about some very specific things. He said, he said, this is what I think about it. This is how I feel about it. We talked about a few weeks ago that God hasn't changed in those things. 
Okay, God hasn't changed in those things. He made it very clear where he stands. So when I say that sin is anything that, that, God, would not, uh, that God would not act on or, or react in that way, I'm not talking about our opinion on it. I'm talking about God's opinion on it. It's not this my Jesus attitude. No, it's not what my Jesus would or wouldn't do. It's what Jesus has already very plainly said he would or would not do. Sin is acting and reacting in any way that God would not have reacted himself as he's revealed it in his word. Sin is furthermore offensive to God. Sin is offensive to God. And if sin is offensive to God, then should it not also be offensive to us? But we have to stop here and be very honest and say that we have, as, as a church even, not just the culture, but as a church, we have become so desensitized to sin, so desensitized to things that literally God say make him puke. We've become so desensitized to those things, we laugh along. And we, we really kind of, it's not a big deal. Now, in public, we would say, yes, it's a big deal. Even in private, we would say, yes, it's a big deal. But, but we endorse it by watching programs that endorse it. If sin is offensive to God, then it would only make sense that sin would be offensive to his people as well. But we've got to be very honest and say that even as the church, we have, we have lost our ability to blush. Nothing bothers us anymore. Nothing is offensive anymore. When I say that sin should be offensive to us, that statement is not meant for the world. That statement is meant for the church. We should not be surprised that the world loves darkness. The scripture says they'll love darkness. That's why they don't want anything to do with Jesus. Because Jesus brings light into their darkness and he shows the darkness for what it is. It, he shows everything. Whenever Jesus comes into the picture, his very character and his very presence starts to shed light on things that the shadows has been hiding. That's why nobody wants Jesus around. That's why men hate the light, because they love the darkness. They love the darkness because the darkness is covering up their hearts. It's covering up their actions. It's covering up the evil of their, of their own intentions. We shouldn't be surprised that the world loves darkness. What surprises me, what alarms me, is how okay the church seems to be getting with the darkness. And I have to include myself in that. As I was writing this today, I just thought about how many things I just let slide because it's become commonplace. You know, you see it every day. It's just now it's just part of our culture. It's just part of life. And I, I begin to think, how used to the darkness have I become? You know, I was thinking about the, the church. When you, when you think about the church, if, if we are individual athletes, then, then in a sense the church is, is a team. And I begin to think the reason the team seems to have so many injuries and so many disqualifications. Now, maybe it's not worse than it used to be, but in my own opinion, I've seemed to notice in the, in the last few years, there seems to be a lot more people falling away. I mean, more people who at one time were strong believers, and now if they believe anything, they barely believe anything. Or they've left the faith altogether. Or there's those who, who maybe they are Christians, but they just got out of the race. And you wonder, why is there so many injuries? Why are there so many disqualifications in the team? Why is this going on in the church? And the answer may be very simple, and that's that we're running in the dark. Rather than allowing God's word to be a lamp to our feet, we're running blind. And, and, and that being said, is it any wonder that so many of us are ending up in the ditch when we're running blind in the dark? God's word sheds very clear light. The scripture says that his word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light to my path. Was it any wonder that so many of us are tripping, so many of us are ending up in the ditch, so many of us are ending up disqualified, so many of us are ending up not even identifying with the team anymore? Is that any wonder when we throw the flashlight out? Furthermore, many of us are not only being disqualified because of the fact that we're not walking in the light. Furthermore, many of us are being disqualified because we are injecting the body. And I don't mean the physical body. I mean the spiritual body, the local body, the church. We're injecting the body sometimes, often, from the pulpit with perform performing enhancing substances that actually do more harm than good. I, I don't know how many, if you just watch clips... If you just watch clips of, of some of the biggest churches in the nation, the message is very simple. God exists for one thing and one thing only, and that is to make you happy. God's whole reason for existence is to put springs on your wagon and to make sure that you never rock. Right? And, and, and if, you, if you're really right with Him, you can claim and you can name anything you want from Him, and He is absolutely forced to do it. 
In the church, we are injecting steroids into the body of Christ that we think will help people, that we think will encourage people, when in reality, those things are doing way more harm than they are good. Worship has become about the human experience rather than the excellence of God. We're pumping people full of man-made chemicals to help them run better, and in reality, what we're doing is we're slowing the church down. No one who refuses to run by the rules will finish the race, much less finish the race well. So both as collectively and individually, we have got something that we have got to confront, and that is sin, darkness, not only in our own lives, but in the church as well. It's a sad reality that the church as, as a team has allowed itself to become so derailed and so disqualified. We face a collective problem in the church, but we also face an individual crisis. The, the team is made up of individuals. So many of our team members, the problem is, why is the church not making any ground forward? The reality is so many of our team members are running with ankle bracelets on. May I say to you, it, this seems very obvious, and, and yes, it seems obvious, but for some reason it's not clicking for us. May I say to you that you can't run with chains around your ankles? You see the prisoner, right? They're, they're, they're chained to one another. They've got chains around their ankles. Well, part of the reason for that is so they can't run away. What, what I'm seeing, and not just in the church, let's, let's boil it down to my own life. What I'm seeing is, okay, we're going to run this race. We're going to obey God. We're going we're to be passionate about the things of God. And, and we're going to take off running. But the thing is, we're running with chains around our ankles. And you're not going to make any progress. Many of us in the church are trying to run with, with ankle chains on, and the sad part is we're doing more falling than running. And those falls, every time we fall, it's causing serious injuries both to our body and to the church body. Those injuries are leaving lifelong scars, and the saddest part is about all this, when I'm talking about these chains, these sins that so easily beset us, the saddest part is most of us are running with the key in our pocket. We are running with, with chains around our ankles, not because we have to, but because we want to. The key has been given to us in Christ. The key has been given to us in the Word. And we refuse to use the key. And the reason we refuse to use the key is because we've really gotten used to and began to enjoy the darkness. If we are going to run our race, we are going to have to lay aside our rebellion. The race that we've been given to run is a race towards Christ. We cannot be running towards Christ and away from Christ at the same time. If we're going to run the race, we have to lay aside our own rebellion. No one can effectively run with chains around their ankles. That includes me. That includes you. It's with this knowledge in mind that we are told that we are to lay aside these sins that so easily ensnare us. Different translations render the word ensnare differently. If you've got the King James, uh, it says beset. If I quote this verse, that's the way I'm going to quote it because that's the way I memorized it. The, the sins that so easily beset us. Uh, other, other translations uh, use the words instead of, instead of beset us, uh, the ESV uses the words clings so closely to us. All of these translations really are driving at the same thought. Every runner who wants to remain eligible to compete and wants to be able to complete his race must lay down whatever has the potential of bringing him down. These sins that beset you, these sins that ensnare you, these sins that entangle you up, these sins that cling so closely to you that you just can't shake them off, these things have to be laid down if we are not just going to compete but complete our race. Now let's get real honest. We've talked very generally. Now let's start getting more specific. And some of you might be thinking, well, that was specific enough. <laughs> let's get a little more specific. Everyone in here tonight, without exception, every one of us has what we call besetting sins. These are sins that uniquely bother us in a way that they may not bother someone else. Our sin nature, we all have a sin nature. And even in coming to Christ and being redeemed and being remade, even in coming to Christ, it's not that that sin nature has yet been done away with. It will one day, but not yet. And we all have this sin nature, but this sin nature expresses itself in different ways. For instance, one person may struggle with anger, but not with lust, while another struggles with lust, but really has no issue with anger. 
Both of these sins, though they're different, they both have detrimental consequences if they're allowed to go unchecked. We might think that lust is worse than anger. Others might think that anger is worse than lust. But both of them are very dangerous. Both of them can trip up the runner and keep the runner from finishing the race. Therefore, one of the most important things we can do as believers, knowing we have these besetting sins, knowing we have, every one of us has specific sins that specifically bother us. They may not bother everybody else in the same way, but there are specific things that we know that come back up over and over and over that we struggle with, that we give into, that we allow to drag us down. Knowing we have these besetting sins, one of the least things we can do as a believer is seek to know what our own weaknesses are. If you've ever watched a, a coach prepare for a big game, just take the ACC, one of the, one of the highlight reels always shows the coaches sitting in a room, all the coaches from the, from the team are together, and they're watching, they're watching games, they're watching film of the other team. They're trying to learn that other team's strengths and weaknesses. They're trying to know their opponent in the best way they can before they go into the game. Can I, can I tell you, our enemy, the devil, Satan, has done his research. He has watched more of your life than you care to realize. He probably, the devil, may know you better than you know yourself. He's done his research. He has identified, he has documented your weaknesses. And knowing that the devil, as the opposing team, knowing that, that he has identified both our strengths and our weaknesses, knowing that he has a plan to play against us, knowing that, should we any less identify our own weaknesses? If he's identified our weaknesses, shouldn't we identify our own weaknesses as well? Should we take our weaknesses any less serious than the devil does? The obvious answer to that is no. But we do, though, don't we? We make so many excuses for ourselves. One of my favorite excuses that, that Christians love to use is, I was born this way. But we won't accept that same excuse when, when someone who, who is in a homosexual relationship says that. Right? Well, that's not true. But why do we accept it for ourselves? Well, I can't help it. I get angry. I, I was just born this way. Well, did not Jesus die for your rebirth? Didn't Jesus die to change that? Maybe sometimes we'll say, I can't help it. Just an excuse, I can't help it. Or I'm just being me. Well, maybe you should quit just being you. <laughs> right? Maybe God wants to change that. Maybe, maybe that's the whole reason you need to be redeemed because you was a sinner. I love this one. My mama was this way. Can I tell you something? God does not want you to be like your mama. He wants you to be like his son. <laughs> We come up with all these excuses that we would dare never let anyone else use, but we'll use them for ourselves. So you need to ask yourself, even sitting here right now, right now tonight, you need to ask yourself, what is my besetting sin? Now I can tell you for myself, I know, I can, I can name one or two things that I know are besetting sins for me. What, I want you to ask yourself what clings to me so closely that I just can't seem to shake it off. And, and this is really easy. This is not complicated to identify. What is the thing that every time you start making progress with God, what is the thing that every time you feel like you're growing, what is the thing that always comes back up that trips you up? I mean, what is that one thing? And it might be more than one thing, but there's at least going to be one. If you cannot identify one thing, if, if you cannot come up with one besetting sin in your life, go home and ask somebody you live with, and I guarantee you they'll tell you at least one besetting sin you have. So can you identify what is the one thing that your whole life, I'm not just talking about the last year, what is the, like, the one thing or the two things or the three things that your whole life keeps dragging you back and keeps you from running the race that you're called to run? And don't tell me you don't, you don't have a problem with this, this, and this. I want you to be honest with yourself about, we're, we're so easy and so quick to say, well, I don't have a problem with that. I'm not asking you about what you don't have a problem with. I'm asking you to identify with what you do have a problem with. If you cannot come up with at least one terrible, absolutely heinous, besetting sin in your own life, then like I said, go ask someone who you know, someone you live with, and I'm sure they can name you several. You know, if, 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 you, cannot, <laughs> if you cannot come up with one besetting sin that troubles you, then I can tell you what your besetting sin is. It's pride. <laughs> okay? Once we've identified the sin that so easily entangles us, then would it make any sense to say, that is the thing that is wrecking my Christian life? Then would it make any sense to say, no, ain't it cute? 
You know, we, we do this with babies. Things that uh, Libby told me uh, one time, a long time ago, if it ain't cute, if it's not going to be cute when they're 20, it ain't cute when they're two. <laughs> right? And we excuse babies because they're babies. And it's so funny. Uh, Lindsay, she doesn't get on to me, but I get this look every once in a while because everything my niece does to me is hilarious, no matter how bad it is. It's so funny. <laughs> But what I have to remember and what I'm sometimes reminded of is that when I'm laughing, I'm encouraging it. You know, this is what we do with our sins. Sometimes we will identify our sins and then we'll say, but it's really not that big a deal. <laughs> I mean, did you see what he, I mean, look at his life, right? The problem is we, we look at the sins that so easily beset us and then we want to make them out to be, to be cute little pets when in reality they're terrible monsters, the problem is we face is we enjoy our pet sins too much to identify them as monsters, as the monsters they are, much less eradicate them from our lives. You know, the problem with, with pet sins is just like puppies. Puppies are so cute when they're small, right? But puppies always grow into full-size dogs. And if, and if full-size dogs aren't tamed, they can grow to be vicious dangers to the neighborhood. We look at our little sins and they're really not that big a deal. And sometimes, though we would never say it out loud, we actually think our little sins are cute. And they make us attractive. And they make us spontaneous. And they make us likable. But really all they do is make God sick. Pet sins, what pet sins eventually do, these besetting sins that we like to think are cute, what these pet sins eventually do is they make pets out of their owners. You see, if, if you feed the beast, the beast will eventually turn around and feed on you one day. Puppies always grow to be dogs. And, and these little cute sins always grow into terrible, vicious monsters. So it's not enough just that we identify our besetting sins. We have to do everything in our power, everything necessary to eradicate them. You remember Paul said in his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 9 and verse 24, he said, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? That makes sense. The whole, the whole field's running, but only one person wins. He goes on, he says, run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. So in other words, everybody who runs, man, they're, they're controlling themselves. They're making sure they're not overeating. They're, they're not drinking too much. They're watching all those things because they want to win the prize. He says, now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Then the, Paul says this, therefore, I run thus. Not with uncertainty. He said, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. Paul says, but I discipline my own body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Paul said, my fight, my fight is not th with things on the outside. Paul says, my things, this is Paul speaking. He said, my th fight is not with things on the outside. My fight is with things on the inside. Paul makes it very clear that he says, I am beating my own body into subjection. I am disciplining myself just like an athlete disciplines themselves so they can run effectively. Paul says, I am disciplining myself. I am bringing the lust of my flesh. I am bringing the lust of my eyes. I'm bringing the pride of life into subjection. Lest, lest it be said that I preached to others about these things and then I myself became disqualified. I myself became a castaway. Paul understood that besetting sins are not harmless. Besetting sins, it's not just that they trip us up and we fall and we get skin up a little bit. No, besetting sins are not harmless. They don't just trip us up. They literally destroy our souls from the inside out. That's why if you don't know what your besetting sin is, you ought to spend some serious time asking God to reveal it to you. Because if you don't know what it is you're fighting, you're not going to fight it. I think it's furthermore worth asking ourselves, is the sin in my life that offends me most actually the sin that offends God most? You know, because we're flesh, we can make the mistake of saying, okay, this is my besetting sin. When all the while, God's over there saying, that's not your real problem. Right? We, we identify the thing that we think, you know, can easily be taken care of. And all along, God's saying, you've got a much bigger problem than that. Sometimes we deceive ourselves into thinking our worst habits are actually our most innocent habits. I think there's some real wisdom. So you've identified your own besetting sins. And I'd say that the majority in here tonight, if not all, have probably already thought of at least one, if not two or three things that you know 
are things that you do, attitudes that you have that are sin against God. They keep coming back up. They keep keeping you from running the race you're supposed to run. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for acknowledging that. But I think sometimes we need to take it a step further and not just say, okay, these are my besetting sins. Sometimes I think there's wisdom in asking God, is the besetting sin that I have identified the one that you would identify as my most dangerous liability? We are blind to ourselves, aren't we? We are. We are going to usually be the last one to see our own faults. And so I think there's wisdom. Even when we've identified our besetting sins, I think there's wisdom in saying, God, would you show me the things about myself that I can't even really see about myself, the things I don't want to see about myself. Besetting sins are, as I've said, different for everyone. Everybody in here probably has at least, definitely has at least one, but you might have two or three primary categories in which you are more susceptible to temptation than other people are. And that doesn't make you a worse person than them. That doesn't mean that you're somehow unforgivable and they're not. It doesn't mean that you're somehow lower on the totem pole. No, it just means that, that because of our makeup, some of us are going to be attracted to some sins more than we are others. But the reality is we can acknowledge we're all going to be attracted to sin. And we have to identify what those sins are. What are the categories that you are susceptible to temptation? Think think about David. David seems to have a lust problem, doesn't he? Right? Peter, though, when you look at Peter, Peter couldn't control his temper. He couldn't control his mouth. It comes back up over and over in the life of Peter. Both of these two, David with his lust problem and Peter with his temper problem, they're different. They're categorically different, but both of them had severe consequences in their life because of those different sins. In some sense, Moses, think about Moses' sin. Moses' sin caused him to get within sight of the promised land and still fall short of the finish line. Moses actually was able to see Canaan but not go into it because he reacted in anger. You look at Moses' life over and over in Moses' life from the time that he killed the Egyptian to the time he smote the rock to the times he went off on Israel. Moses had an anger problem. And it was that anger problem that kept him from going into Canaan. He saw it but he never experienced it. Think about Saul. Saul, though he was anointed by God, he was Israel's first king. It was pride that disqualified him from running the race he'd been given to run. When we think of Saul, we don't think of Israel's first king. We don't think of the good things. When I bring the name Saul up, how many of you can list good things that Saul did? Well, early on in his reign, Saul was a good king. right? Saul, Saul didn't start out on the wrong foot, if you will. But Saul let pride begin to control him. And when we think of Saul, all we think of is a list of bad things that Saul did. Pride disqualified Saul from the race he'd been given to run. No matter its nature, sin is devastating. And therefore, we ought to be especially aware of the areas in our own life that we're more prone to be tempted and the areas in which we are more prone to give in to temptation. Let's just be serious for a moment. And you might think, well, I thought we'd have already been serious. Let's get, take a little step further, right? Let's be serious for a moment and consider the fact that besetting sins have tripped up and have disqualified people who were more gifted and more godly than we are. Think about all the serious athletes. And let's just talk about the natural realm for a second. All the serious athletes who uh, accomplish great things, but now when their name comes up, all you think about is cheating. Lance Armstrong, Barry Bonds, Justin Gatlin, Marion Jones... Each of these athletes were from different sports, but they all share one thing in common, and that's they were stripped of their records, they were stripped of their titles, and they were stripped of their medals because they were caught using performance-enhancing substances. And you know, every one of them, well, maybe not every one of them, but some of them to this day swear that they did not know what they were doing was illegal. And can I just say, they they might be telling the truth. They really might not have known what they was doing was illegal, but if they'd have read the rule book, they would have known They could say they didn't know what they were doing was illegal, but that did not change the consequences of their actions. Eventually, think about this, eventually what they were taking in took them out. These names that should be remembered for great physical accomplishments are now often only what could have been stories. Now, in your own life, and I I could name names, in your own life, think of all the great men and women of God. Think of the people that you didn't even know, but the people whose stories, the pastors, the nationally known pastors, whose story eventually comes out on television, all the things that they were caught up in. We could all go through a list of those names. Think about people that you've known personally that were great Christians that seemed to really love the Lord, but suddenly something came out 
And what came out came out from the inside, not the outside. Something came out, and they were disqualified from their race. Think about all these people who are more godly, uh, who, are, who are in a lot of ways have more wisdom, who are, who are more talented than many of us, but they gave in to some temptation that they thought would never get the best of them, and now they're not even in the race anymore. And there's a real question, were they even ever on the team? There is, I think, for each of us a healthy fear of the flesh that we need to live with. We are people who do not need to live in fear of the condemnation of God. I'm not afraid of, of God in the sense that he is going to condemn me when I stand before him. I'm afraid of myself, though. My brother asked me one time, uh, at, at the end of my life, what's the one thing that I want to be said about me? My first response was, look, he's moving, right? That was, that was the number one thing I wanted to be said about me at my funeral. But then I got a little more serious, and I said, he said, what's the one thing you really want to be said about you at your funeral? And I said, I want to be able to say that I was faithful. Because I've seen so many who I admired that weren't. And, and I, am, I have a little bit, to a degree, and you may disagree with this theologically, but I think to a degree there is a, there is a healthy fear that we should have of our own flesh, of what we are capable of. I know this, I can trust God, but I can't trust me. I wonder how many promising student athletes have lost scholarships because of an injury that could have been avoided. I mean, I wonder how many young people have injured their knee or they've blown out their shoulder doing something that had nothing to do with their particular event, right? Playing some game that had nothing to do with the game that they got a scholarship for. There was a girl that I was uh, friends with in high school, and she was on the, the stunt team at North Surrey. And I remember one day, I, I saw it happen. She ran, and you know, she was just, we were teenagers, young, carefree. She ran, and she jumped off a set of, a set of stairs, and she thought, obviously, that she would end on her feet. She kind of, in that moment, as a teenager, thought that gravity wouldn't catch up. So she ran, she jumped off the stairs, but, but when she jumped off the stairs, the, the flight was fine. It was the landing that was problematic. She landed on her ankle. She missed the entire season uh, that year as far as the stunt team being a cheerleader because she thought somehow that she could defy the laws of nature and get away with it. I think about that often because what she did seemed so innocent, like not such a big deal, but it cost her so dearly. The athlete who wants to win must watch not just what he does, but how he thinks. You see, how we think will govern how we act. Anyone who thinks their sin will never destroy them may already be halfway destroyed and not even know it. Your besetting sin may not be some vile sexual immorality. It may be something as simple as doubting God. You see, constantly asking questions that God has already answered, refusing to accept the answers that he's already given, will begin to make you wonder if the race is worth running, and furthermore, is the race even real? Maybe your besetting sin is self-reliance. I think self-reliance is one of the most harmful sins a Christian can practice. See, we'll say, well, I'm not practicing all these particular sexual sins that we think are so terrible. But really, sometimes the more harmful sins are the ones that we think look so innocent. Self-reliance is one of the most harmful sins a Christian can practice because self-reliance is like trying to run without air in your lungs. Self-reliance is assuming that you can be both the lung and the oxygen at the same time. Do you understand what I just said? Self-reliance is assuming that you can be both the lung and the oxygen at the same time. The race we've been given to race is a supernatural race, and only the Spirit of God can enable us to run it, to run it well, and to finish it. He is the breath in our lungs. He's the, the wind under our wings, if you will. Doing the Christian life in our own strength, it's like holding our breath and trying to run a marathon. You see, your, your besetting sin may not be pornography. It may not be stealing. It may all, all these things. Your besetting sin may be self-reliance, thinking that you can be the lung and the oxygen at the same time. Maybe gossip and suspicion is what keeps you from making progress. Let me say gossip and suspicion doesn't just keep you from making progress. It keeps the whole team from making progress. It's hard to run a race with any kind of effectiveness if you're spending all your time looking around at everyone else, wondering and surmising which of the other team members are actually traitors. Of course, we can't let pride and selfish ambition go unmentioned. I, I wonder how many runners are only, running, are only running to be applauded by the fans in the stands. There's no real consideration of what it means to receive a well done from God. You know something? When you're running with your eyes on the stands, I guarantee you, you're going to trip. When your eyes are not looking at the race that's before you and you're looking at everything that's around you, you are going to fall. 
You know, one of the problems with falling might be not just the damage you do to yourself, but all the other people you bring down with you. Have you ever seen those races where they're running, they're running as hard as they can, and one guy trips, and before you know it, half the field is on the ground. An ounce of pride may well be more dangerous because it is more deceitful than a ton of immorality. Look, we don't have time to discuss pornography, greed, sexual immorality, lying, stealing, backbiting, and, and all the other hosts of offenses that Baptists are guilty of. People like us. We don't have time to discuss every sin that the flesh loves to indulge, but we can say that they are all dangerous, and not only will they trip us up, they may trip someone else up who's running close to us, and that ought to break our hearts. The will to win is important. Proper training is a necessity. But both the will to win and proper training are both insufficient if we're still eating trash. We've all got different tastes, and it may be that, think about this, every time you begin to diet, there's that one particular food that messes you up. The food category that always gets me is all of it, right? Just kind of all of it. <laughs> You know, though, when you diet, there's those, there's those certain things that just kind of grab you, and they ruin the whole thing. In the same way, you finally you give in to them. You just say, well, I might as well just eat this one. And before you, you start with that one little Debbie, and then the whole box is gone. And you hadn't even finished that one episode of Law and Order yet. That's human nature. After indulging, then you, feel, you don't feel satisfied. Well, you, you feel worse. Not only because you you've ate that many little Debbies at one time, you feel worse because you have just broken everything you've been trying to do. Rather than satisfied, you feel worse, you feel guilty, and it's a vicious cycle of indulgence and guilt. It's the same way we all have particular sins, particular little Debbies that we are particularly prone to. These things trip us up. Every time we start making a little progress, these things come back up. I tell you, for myself, and you might... Can I identify with this as well? I've found that in my life, the times when I've had the greatest failures has always been on the heels of the greatest successes. Whenever God has seemed to do the most through me or I've seen the greatest things happen in my life right on the heels of those things, sometimes in the same day, I've seen my own greatest sins and greatest failures. These things trip us up just when we start making little progress and when we indulge these same old sin patterns, what does it do? It doesn't satisfy us. It leaves us feeling guilty and it leaves us feeling like we can't even get back up and start running again. It becomes easy to believe I'll never be able to do better and, and that kind of hopelessness leads us to sin. What we do, because I'll never be able to do better, so then what do we do? We go into even deeper sin and try to use that sin as a sedative to make us feel better. That sedative, we try to cover the feelings of shame we're having for the sin we just committed, and the sin cycle is so vicious. You indulge it, you feel guilty. And in order to, in order to cover the guilty, the guilty feelings, you indulge it a little more. And then before you know it, you are being controlled by something that you thought you had control over. Besetting sins will not just keep us from making progress, they will eventually keep us from running at all. Eventually you'll start to believe that it would just be better, it would just be easier if you just sit down on the sidelines and forget about the race. Besetting sins are dangerous, therefore we are warned to lay them aside, and not just lay them aside, but don't pick them back up. Now, having said all that, there might be some here feeling, you feel like you've just been driven into the ground so deep, running is not even an option. To those who, who may feel like you're sitting on the sidelines already, I want to remind you that our race is not a race of competition. Our race is a race of completion. The good news about that, what, what that means to you, is you can get back up right where you fail and keep running. You don't have to bury yourself right there and say, that's it. We're not racing to compete with anybody. We're racing to complete our own race. So right where you fail, you can get back up and start running from there again. However, however great your sin is, the grace of God is greater still. The best thing you can do when you give in to one of these besetting sins is not, oh, woe is me, and not, I'm just, I'm never going to be anything. No, no, that is not the right answer. What, what do we do when we give in to one of these besetting sins? What do we do? We run straight to the cross of Jesus and say, the cross paid for this. The grace of God covers this. It's God's intervention that gives us hope for recovery. I can, I can fall, but I can get back up and I can run again because the cross has already covered it. 
My concern for most people is not that most people don't know about God's grace and God's forgiveness. My concern really in the church today is that most people know just enough about the grace and the forgiveness of God to abuse it. I mean, how many times have we seen people, again, to go back to Facebook, they are posting lives that are just completely contrary to Scripture. And then in the next, in the next line, it's, oh, God forgives. Isn't God good and God's gracious? They know just enough about the grace and the mercy of God to misunderstand it. To completely take it out of context. Will God forgive? Paul said that we're not to go on sinning. Should we sin that grace may abound? The obvious answer is no. You've got to understand that Paul would not have to ask that question if there was not a logical conclusion that if we go on sinning, grace will abound. That is what the great thing about the grace of God. No matter how far we go in sin, the grace of God will abound. But Paul backs up and he says, knowing that should we go on in sin, that grace may abound? No. Grace is not an excuse to sin. Grace is a reason not to sin. Why would I want to sin against that kind of mercy, against that kind of love? The attitude, oh well, God forgives, that may be true, but why do we think it's okay to keep putting God in a position where he has to forgive? Now, I, look, I'm, I don't want to lead you wrong here. God does forgive. God will forgive. But sometimes we take that as an excuse to put him in a place where he has to forgive. That is using grace as an excuse to sin. It's sinning against grace, and sinning against grace may be even proof to us that grace has not yet been received. Sinning against grace is a dangerous thing. So I say to you if, you, if you've fallen out of the race somewhere along the way, give up whatever it was that got you down, get up off the ground, and because of the cross, start running again. You may feel behind, but that doesn't matter. It's a race of completion, not a race of competition. To those of you who, who may be running and you're running well, I, I, I'm encouraging you, be careful. Because that besetting sin is always just around the corner. And I guarantee you when you're making progress, it's when it's going to pop back up. We can't keep running and sinning at the same time. We have to choose one of the two. So my encouragement to you tonight is lay aside anything that weighs you down, as we said on Sunday. But I encourage you furthermore... Not just to let go of what weighs you down, I encourage you to lay aside everything that has the possibility of tripping you up.